he got to the point to where he was literally selling scotch guard and thermal underwear out of a box on every bus and you know there was scotch guard in their blue jeans there was right? scotch guard in their blue jeans and that, that was the ski pants of the day exactly you know <clears throat> the, everybody had sweatshirts and you know a hunting jacket they could throw on but nobody knew how to keep their legs dry and warm so he was selling them you know thermal underwear long johns back in those days and, and a scotch guard to cover their jeans and and so that's when he kind of decided that you know he should be selling some of this stuff like to thank our title sponsor, B1 Bank. B1 Bank knows that entrepreneurs like you are always thinking one step ahead. So you need banking solutions that can keep up. It begins with lending. Does your business need working capital or financing for new equipment? How about a real estate or a construction loan? Good news, the B1 Lending team is ready to learn your goals and help you find the best lending option available. Now let's talk about uncomplicating your daily cash flow. B1 offers a full array of treasury management services that let you collect funds faster, pay funds more efficiently, and access your information with powerful online tools. Most importantly, B1 understands the value of working with local nonprofits to build a stronger community. They believe in giving back through hands-on involvement with their B1 community outreach program because it's simply the right thing to do. B1 Bank. Be uncomplicated. To learn more, visit B1Bank.com. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. Hello, I'm Andrew McClendon, your host of the Next Entrepreneur Podcast. We're here today in the Propel Production Podcast Studio in Baton Rouge, and we welcome our guest, Mr. Michael Matthews, owner of The Backpacker. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. In the unlikely event, any of our listeners or viewers are not familiar with The Backpacker, which is very unlikely for those faraway listeners. Can you give us a rundown of the backpacker operation today? Yeah, so we have two storefronts, one in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, one in Lafayette, an hour away. Uh, we have an online presence, and then we also have a, uh, in both, and all that is referred to as the backpacker or backpackeroutdoors.com. And then we also have a, another company called Backpacker Tours, which is a travel company that specializes in ski trips. That is, uh, has its own staff and is run underneath our umbrella, but also has a separate team. So you guys are selling outdoor gear, shoes, apparel, backpacks, mm-hmm. kayaks, tents, back, you know, camping stuff, right? Yeah, we, we go everywhere from running um, apparel, athleisure apparel, all the way to technical backpacks and tents and uh, technical kayak fishing gear for people who love to hit the salt water uh, in a kayak. So. Yeah, it's such a cool place to go and shop. And I mean, there's just, you know, you can walk in some stores and there's like, okay, there's absolutely nothing in this store that I want or need. The backpacker is <laughs> a complete opposite. Okay, everything in this store I would like to have. It's so cool, man. I mean, you can just go in there. Some and there have been times I just go in there and just kind of chill out, you know, just get my mind off or something and look at cool stuff, you know. Oh yeah. So your dad founded the business. Dale Matthews founded the business back in seventy four. Correct. Right? Uh-huh. It's just grown into this amazing brand, and it's just so cool to see. I know you were young, but I do remember the store. His first store, which was out at LSU. Mm-hmm. And I remember it being somewhat of a hole in the wall. A small place, uh, had a really cool vibe to it, kind of a ski chalet kind of little vibe to it, but very, very small. I bought my first backpack there, my first real backpack there, North Face. I think he was doing a lot of ski tours back then. What, what was the origin of his business? You know, my dad grew up in Baton Rouge, just like I did. Grew up in University Acres and went to University High School right there on the LSU's campus and then went to LSU. Um, so very much, you know, a South Baton Rouge guy, not, um, you know, nothing that would have connect him to the mountains from a young man, other than the fact that he would go up there with his, his dad would take him up there and he was in Boy Scouts and did some of those things. But when he got to college, um, he was working at the LSU Union, and they asked him to plan a ski trip 
which had never been done for LSU in the late 60s. You know, my dad being who he was, he's entrepreneurial up to the task, uh, planned the first LSU organized ski trip to Red River, New Mexico um, with charter buses and everything. And he quickly realized that he could do this himself. And he, uh, you know, started organizing ski trips on his own through the late 60s and early 70s, primarily to LSU students and their friends and all that. And, And he got to the point to where he was literally selling Scotchgard and thermal underwear out of a box on every bus. And, you know, there was Scotchgard in their blue jeans. There was Scotchgard in their blue jeans. And that that was the ski pants of the day. Exactly. You know, everybody had sweatshirts and, you know, a hunting jacket they could throw on, but nobody knew how to keep their legs dry and warm. So he was selling them, you know, thermal underwear, long johns back in those days and, and a Scotchgard to cover their jeans. And, and so that's when he kind of decided that, you know, he should be selling some of this stuff. And you know, being in South Louisiana, opening a ski shop, a pure ski shop doesn't exactly yeah. lend itself to that. But he knew he enjoyed doing the ski trips and he knew that he enjoyed selling stuff. And he was a sales guy. He, he was selling encyclopedias all over the country as a college student. And he was uh, selling copy machines when he got out of college, still doing the ski trips. So when he knew he couldn't open a ski shop, he decided to go open an outdoor shop. And that started the backpacker. And that started the backpacker. So the ski tour business was a big part of his revenue stream early on, right? Yeah, I mean, that's how he got started. That was in 74, and the business built up over time. He was open in LSU till 86, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to get into the story about how the business grew from there and, of course, how you got involved but I was just, I just wanted to give a nod to your father is having, you know, started the business and uh, I watched him from afar and never, I don't know that I ever shook his hand, but I uh, uh, saw him many times in the store. What a great brand and a great business. Uh, Thank you. He made, you know, it's interesting when and we've talked with a lot of uh, people, some children of entrepreneurs and, you know, there's, there's this thing about, it's common where entrepreneurs as parents are absent. They're you know, they're engaged in their business and it's taken everything they can to get to stability. I was just curious what y'all's family setup was in that way, because it seemed like with all the cool stuff you had access to, it seems like there'd be a great opportunity for y'all to do cool stuff. Yeah. You know, my dad's always, he was very committed to the backpacker and uh, still is today, even as he's retired and uh, no longer an owner, but it very much fit his personality as far as loving adventure and loving gear and packing up for a trip and all that stuff. So when we were kids, the business was established by the time, uh, you know, we were late eighties, early nineties when we were old enough to do stuff and travel with him. And so he was always taking us on ski trips to go on, whether it was a backpacker organized trip or just something with the family, he would take us backpacking in Colorado trips to North Carolina, everything that he loved, he included us with. So, and so he instilled that in us and my sister and my brother and I, we all, Love the outdoors and love the adventures that we do and we did growing up. That sounds pretty idyllic. Yeah, (laughs) it kind of was. You know, we got to do a lot of fun stuff that most kids, especially from Louisiana, wouldn't get to do. So you worked with him for a long time. Mm -hmm. Looking back on on that time, how would you define his management style? Um, let's see. The I you know, I worked with my dad closely for probably about three years from my late uh, teens into my early 20s. Um, So by the time that I was there, he was, you know, he was still very much involved with the business. He would do uh, floor checks with the store managers, you know, routinely, multiple times a week. He was uh, writing newsletters for the employees. He was selling ski trips at his desk every day. He would have his checklist for the yard guy to make sure that the outside of the store looked great. He was very involved very uh, up until the very, um, up until he retired. I mean, he was just yeah. very hands-on. What would you say is the top one or two things that you learned from him as far as business? <laughs> There's so many things. I mean, probably the one thing that I've instilled and appreciated the most is uh, just hard work yeah. and and perseverance and pick up a lot of things growing up. My dad's, all, my dad's entrepreneurial in almost every way. I mean, we spent weekends working on rental houses. You know, as soon as I had my driver's license, I was cleaning bathrooms at one of his office buildings that he had. And, you know, so I guess to follow up that question, it was just always 
Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Take your problems and work them out. And if you got a challenge, figure it out. Always been the type of guy to figure it out, persevere, and work hard at it. And that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned most from him. So he's a mentor still to you today? Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. So you bought the business in 06, mm-hmm. right? Uh, coming out of college. And we're going to, of course, get to that. But I, I, I read a few things in doing the research on you, what I found really interesting. And one of them, it, it kind of, I, 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 I take it that it, it's at the root of it is culture, right? And the first story involved your dad and it's post-Katrina. And I read the story, and uh, you guys uh, had a family place on in past Christiane and got wiped out. It's interesting reading about that, and you know y'all y'all finding that discovery and everything. But when he got back, or when y'all got back to Baton Rouge, he realized something needed to be done, right, to help so many people that were in in, in a real time of need. And so he reached out to a vendors, a bunch of your uh, vendors, and and asked them, say, guys, we need some help here, and started to get some product being donated from them from all over the country, and ended up, you know, giving away tens of thousands of items, pairs of shoes and sleeping uh, pads and uh, apparel and things like that, which I was like, you know, it seemed like a real uh, a call, you know, from the heart, right? And I'm like, okay, that says a lot about their culture. And then I read under your leadership, this was in 2016 in the Baton Rouge flood, again, a time of need here in the city, and the backpacker and your employees came together and raised a bunch of money in a really short period of time to help people. I'm like, okay, that's cool. There's some really embedded culture there. So I wanted to give that as a backdrop to the question, like what what was a culture that, that your father had established, if any, that you inherited, and then follow up to that is how do you think that's changed the culture in your company under your leadership? Yeah, I mean, you know, looking back on it, the backpacker's always been a place that attracts people who are interested in having fun, people who love adventure and gear and going outdoors. And so without a doubt, the outdoor world and community has a culture of, you know, casual dress, love for the outdoors, obviously, and all those things. And he always passed that along and put his, you know, businessman hat on top of that, Yeah, if that kind of makes sense, and was able to create an environment that provided jobs and held people accountable. And, you know, he had a great staff that worked for him for a long time and worked for me as well. You know, when I got the impression of moving into that is that they really enjoyed that environment and of being in there in that world and, and uh, working with a family business. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. There's, it's, it's, there's things that get demanding, you know, you got retail hours, you've got store managers, they come and they go as they realize that, you know, um, some of these hours might not be what I want for myself or my family, or they decide they want to pursue a uh, different type of career in outdoors, being on the manufacturer side or that kind of thing. But it seems like the culture is definitely very oriented around that type of personality, the types of people that love outdoors and love gear and yeah. want to sell it and help customers get ready for their big trips. Yeah, very cool. I mean, uh, retail is a high turnover business, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's just the nature of it. Especially on the salespeople, for sure. Okay, so let's dial it back a little bit to you growing up. And so I know you worked in the stores uh, throughout the years, but you also did a you did other jobs, right? You mentioned mm-hmm. helping your dad on properties. And tell us about some of your other work experiences. Growing up, you know, my parents were very much pro having a job and being productive with our time and that kind of thing. When I was 12 years old, you know, we had rental houses in um in the neighborhood and we hit my dad had this triplex lots of surface area you know multiple buildings that kind of thing and he's to give you an idea of how the type of guy my dad is incredibly thrifty and creative with how he makes sure that things get done properly and when he hires a painter he requires a base coat and two top coats and he would tell the painting crew well when you do the base coat i want to come check it when you do this first coat, I want to come check it. 
and I'll give you more paint for the second coat. And so he would come and check the base coat, come and check the first coat after they were done with the first coat, and then he would bring them the second round of paint for the second top coat because he knew that painters didn't like to do two coats on the top. Well, he would come back and check the top coat with the new paint that he brought him, and he always would choose a darker shade than the first coat. And he would walk around with a fresh brush of paint and dab it on sides of the building in, in various spots to see how it would dry to make sure that everything, every surface was covered with the second coat of different color paint, just different enough. So when I was 12, he put me in charge of, you know, painting one of these triplexes and, you know, it would be a family affair. My sister and brother would help out a little bit, but I was always at home and I had a bike and I was younger than them. They had cars at that point. So I'd be on my bike with a paintbrush and paint can riding over to uh, Cloverdale and painting this triplex and sanding it down and everything and spent the whole summer doing it. I think at the end of the summer, he gave me a check for $180 and uh, which uh, probably would have been today, probably an eight or $10,000 job. I realized then that between that and working, doing yards and that kind of stuff, that that wasn't something I I had checked that box in my life. So I'd done those kind of jobs, worked in the yards and worked, I worked for a commercial landscaper that was actually my dad's landscaper. He picked me, he scooped me up one summer and had me out there uh, that he had, you know, like the Ryan's family steakhouses. We'd go and trim and do all that. So had all the different kinds of, whether it was painting rent houses or cutting down trees at rent houses or, I mean, pumicing toilets, you know, did that, did landscape. I was excited to get to college and try and figure out what I wanted to do to make sure that that wasn't something that was my priority. So I majored in finance at LSU, took a lot of interest in that, worked in the business with my dad. I was actually a store manager. He had a a hockey shop when hockey was real big in the late 90s when Louisiana actually had hockey teams around the Kingfish and the ice skaters and all that stuff. He had a little hockey shop on government street and senior year in high school. I was the, you know, assistant manager of that store. So really, yeah, did some of those things. And then when I was at LSU, I took a lot more interest in finance and business and learning about, you know, wanted to learn more about fortune 500 companies and that kind of thing. Just sheer curiosity of size. I worked for Shaw group um, as an intern in the uh, president's office at the time. And that was a a good learning experience for a summer. So I I definitely got to check quite a few different boxes of different work that I'd got to do. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he made sure, you know, y'all stayed busy, got some experience, worked hard. Absolutely. Um, And then, and then come once you're all polished up, then come and visit him. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Like I think that uh, finance degree is, is, is one of the best things you can do before going into business. We would like to thank MBD Automation for their support of the Next Entrepreneur podcast. MBD Automation is a mechanical install contractor with a program-centric focus. So what do these guys do? They install conveyor systems, VRCs, platforms, singulators, sorters, and all sorts of other types of automated equipment. Who do they work for? They work for systems integrators, manufacturers and end users in fulfillment centers, airports, mail processing facilities, and projects in the defense industry. MBD Automation works for numerous Fortune 500 companies across the United States and has a list of international clients that they perform work for in the U.S. as well. If MBD Automation can help you on your next project, you can find them online at mbdautomation.com. Actually, that second store, the Jefferson Highway store, is what happened next, right? And your your dad had built that. The thing that was impressive about that is how unique it was to Baton Rouge, but really to any outfitter store that I had been to at that time. A big lodge style, big timbers and beams and a, the huge stone fireplace. And I think there was a climbing wall on it at one point. Or yeah. <laughs> maybe, and repelling up and down that thing, so... But also what was cool about that store was I remember the big carpet ski hill. What what was that thing called? It was called Mount Snow. Mount Snow. Yeah, and snow was spelled S-N-E-A-U-X. Yeah, of course. Yeah. For Louisiana, right? That carpet would, I guess, go backwards or yeah it would rotate just like a treadmill so if your skis were point on the ski slope your skis are pointed downhill the carpet rotates towards you just as a treadmill would 
when you're running on it. Of course, you guys are selling skis and <laughs> snowboards and all the gear, and people are getting up on there, trying their skis. Or Well, the big thing was the lessons. So, you know, the travel company was still very much a part of the business and right. still is today. And um, he had the opportunity to teach people how to, you know, when you, when you ski, you got pizza and French fries, which are known for s- slow and fast and you're early to, in your early levels of skiing. Yeah. The, the pizza is appointed. Yeah. Yeah. You're pointed skis, right? Right. You point your tips together to and slow you down. Plow the snow. Yeah. Exactly. Snow plow. Exactly. Yeah. And so you, you're able to teach those basics uh, on that ski slope. And then it had a bar that was about chest or shoulder height and you would hold that bar and they would turn on the machine and you would feel the, the, the machine moving underneath you just as simulating the snow. Yeah. And you would start to learn to snow plow as you hold that bar and how yeah. it would pull you backwards. And then you could pull your skis together and accelerate. And even to the point to where they could teach you how to turn. Yeah. So that you could knock out a series of basic ski lessons of just technique on this two-story inside of a building ski treadmill, yeah. more or less. Yeah. And it was brought a lot of memories to a lot of people. And then they would also do birthday parties on it where you had d- saucer sleds and kids would rent it and they'd serve ice cream and cake and kids would come over there and sled down the hill <laughs> and uh, have their birthday parties there. It was, oh, that's and awesome. You ask anybody who grew up in the in Baton Rouge in the late 80s and early 90s, Chances are they've been to a birthday party on Mount Snow. Yeah, that's amazing. So in the first store, small store we mentioned, I'm sure your, your, your father could bootstrap that financially. This Jefferson Highway store was a you know real investment of uh, capital and the land and the building. So at, by that point, he was bankable and ready to roll. And then, of course, all the inventory and, and getting that thing going. But that kind of like was... It, it it was a big deal. That store was a big deal. And yeah. then, of course, it kept expanding, right? It kept getting larger. You know, he had a store. So he had two stores in the late 70s, <clears throat> early 80s. One of them was always the LSU store. And then he had another store on Jefferson near Government Street. There's a shopping center over there that people are familiar with between Clay Cut yeah, and, yeah. and Government on Jefferson. And that was his the store that he actually moved into the new Jefferson Highway I location see. that that you're familiar with now. And so that was a that was a uh, big step for him, and I know that it was a big deal. He added over the years, he added things like the CC Lockwood Gallery as part of uh, the outdoor photographer that added space. He all, he added um, additional staff for you know purchasing and receiving and those kind of things because before it was just this building with a tiny stock room and ski slope and a showroom floor. Probably the biggest expansion he did. He had a huge canoe yard in the back where they stored canoes for sale and for rent and they rented all this gear and they and so they had a ton of storage back there and they actually tore all that down and added office spaces to maximize the use of the land it's very it's a very good piece of land and it was a you know storing canoes out in the uh, louisiana yeah. heat was kind of a waste of the space so he realized that and, and added on to it as you're talking about that i can get a clear visual of, of all of that i remember seeing all that Okay, so that kind of brings us in our timeline to when you're getting ready to get into business, right? 06. Tell, tell us, you're getting out of college. Tell us how that went down. I mean, how is it that a guy coming out of college is going to, boom, walk into a, a, a business like that? I was working, I had been working in when I was in sophomore, junior in college. I was doing inventory at the Backpacker and helping with ski trips, helping sell ski trips. I was working there probably 30, 40 hours a week as a full-time student. So it was very much an involved job. And I decided that I wanted at least an opportunity to see what else, see what the rest of the world was like out there as far as um, what my career, where, where my career options were. So that's when I went to the LSU job fair and met some great guys over at Shaw Group and they gave me a great position to work underneath the, in, in the side of the president's office. And it was exciting work, working for a big company, just seeing some of that. I was there only a short period of time, but it was, an, it was eye-opening. Right. And it was, and that was in 2005, that was right before Hurricane Katrina hit. You know, everybody knows when Katrina hit, everybody knows where they were, what they were doing at that time in life. It was a very big event for South Louisiana. He had an offer on the business. It wasn't inked in. It was just a, a, something that he kind of said, I'm going to pursue this if you're not interested in the business. And I'm 
you know, I'm ready to retire. Your mom's going to retire in a year. We want to travel and do stuff together. So he, um, we kind of, I thought about it, spent a couple of weeks kind of deciding. And what I came to terms with is that, you know, the, whatever, career I wanted to pursue outside of the backpacker would be there waiting for me if I knew that the backpacker wasn't going to be for me. And so I I said, I don't want to look back 20 years from now and see our business, our family business that he grew uh, and think about, you know, how life could have been different or anything like that. I want to at least take a shot at this thing. So that was at the end of 2000, that was in summer of 2005. And so I dropped all up, gave my notice at Shaw group and went straight in my last year of college and worked full time and learned as much as I could about the business in a very short period of time, as far as buying the merchandise. And back then, you know, my dad was very hands-on with so many angles of the business. I mean, the ski travel company, the purchasing of all the apparel and the gear and all that. Um, He had, he had buyers to help do some of the buying, but it was probably 70, 80% was on him So he was just, he had a full workload and he had 40 years experience doing it. So he was plowing through it quick, you know, and, and I just, I tried to keep up, you know, but a lot of it was trial by fire. And so a year later, after I graduated college was in late 2006 or in mid 2006, that's when I actually took ownership of the business and he stayed on for another year and retired a year later. And so that's kind of how the decision was made. He wanted to put me in a position where I would take full responsibility for things, whether he was right. there or helping in any capacity. He wanted to make sure that I was aware of what was at stake. So I'm guessing as a young man, you know, part of that, not trying to get into the details of your family business, but yeah. there had to be some kind of payout, you know, paying your father out versus someone giving him, you know, uh, offer to buy the whole business right and he could have walked away with a check so it's a big difference there so clearly he probably had a desire to just like you did see where it could go and yeah we had we built a structure where i could pay him off uh, uh, over 15 years and it, it worked for both of us and it was challenging at times for sure but we were able to make it work and we figured it out when did the next location come online so we, after Katrina hit, we started looking around for different opportunities to add another location. Right. I think that he had always been interested in another location, but he didn't, you know, in his 50s, he didn't feel the need to pursue that based on his position in life. And so I think that when I was interested in the business, he said, we, you know, we should really do this. And Katrina's going to, you know, shape some landscape in Louisiana. And I think that we should try and, I think it's a good opportunity to try and expand at this point. So, so with his guidance and with his suggestions, we started looking for property kind of within an hour of Baton Rouge, Lafayette, North Shore area, uh, New Orleans area. We pursued North Shore and Lafayette with two good spots to be in. And we were able to, uh, we had a, we, met with the owners of River Ranch, which is a a really well-known, great development in Lafayette, and they were able to build the building up for us. So So they did a a build to suit suit for you? Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. It's a big building. How big is that one? Um, That one we have 9,300 square feet. So it's still pretty big, even in today's retail world. Yeah, yeah. And and that one has been a good business as well. I mean, Lafayette's a great market. We love uh, working with our customers over there. It's really interesting because, you know, your flagship store, if you call it in Baton Rouge, Mm -hmm. it's like 28,000 you mentioned. So your Lafayette stores, you know, a third of that effectively. Correct. When you see the images of it on your website, it's a big store. It still looks, you know, you know, very big. Let's talk about online sales Mm -hmm. today. When you look at the part of your business today, how much of an impact is that on your business? The actual financial sales that happen on the website are small. They're growing, and we're um, we're seeing a um, a lot of traction on that side of the business. Believe it or not, percentage wise, it still uh, you know accounts for less than ten percent. But the traffic that we get from the local markets is really high. People shop out. They print out things online. They they take interest in what we have in stock. We show what's in inventory and those kind of things, and it serves as a great avenue you know when the pandemic hit 
we had just switched over to a new platform that was going to help us bridge inventory. One of the hardest things of being a retailer and an online retailer at the same time is that you've got two separate inventory models of how inner e-commerce world views things and how the retail world views things. And bridging those two has always been a challenge for us. There's there's computer programs out there that do it, but it's it's been a challenge. We've had people frustrated. We've had managers that come in and they get frustrated with it. And we finally had sorted that out in 2019. And when the pandemic hit, the it really kind of propelled the website to becoming a much larger a much more serious part of our business. And we've been able to learn from it and grow it even since the pandemic. And it's, it's becoming more and more of a important part of our business and we're investing that for sure. But like you say, uh, your customers can go on your website and do research and walk in the door and really kind of zero in on what they're looking for. They've done a lot of the questions and answers before they even come to see you. I'm guessing they do. And they kind of know what our inventory looks like online shoppers are online shoppers there's value in the in the e-commerce world and it helps the shopper and our goal is to use it as a tool so that customers have a better experience with us it used to be you know e-commerce was a big threat to retail to brick and mortar retail and then it became that e-commerce was you know more of a something that everybody needs to adopt kind of thing right. uh, for brick and mortar retail. Now we've, we use it as a tool to expand our experience outside of our walls. And so we see the a huge benefit of how the two really work, you know, together to, to create a great experience for our customers. Can you see where your e-commerce percentages will grow moving forward? I mean, are you seeing that, that trajectory now? We do. We see it becoming a um, much larger part of our, you know, we see it being our our goal and our vision for it is to become equal to a third store, a true third store. Yeah. So it, it has its own team. We continue in, continue to invest in new ways to convert customers, new ways to introduce the website to customers, and we're investing in our people to run it as well. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you describe that as another store. We've heard that here on the podcast from another guest. I'm trying to remember who it was. But, you know, it's really interesting. When you look at all the capital expenditures for buying land and building a building or leasing a building and to consider that that equivalent revenue or income could come off of a, a, a e-commerce distribution is pretty fascinating. Does that, does your e-commerce come out of the back of your stores or, or do you have a separate facility to do e-commerce? Um, most of the operations are being handled in our Baton Rouge store. We do ship from both stores, but we pull inventory from the stores, but we are, starting to explore new inventory management styles to help with the website and to be able to feed inventory directly to yeah. an e-commerce customer. Do you see the day where you may have a separate distribution warehouse? It's, anything's possible. Yeah. We have so much space to work with that are Baton Rouge building right now. It's really nice from a culture standpoint. I mean, we have a lot of young, energetic minds in our business yeah, that, uh, yeah. and we and we really like working together, yeah. and so uh, that's the thing that I don't want to lose yeah. in our main location is that, you know, I get to see. I don't work directly with the ecom team every day, but I like to see them and say hello and yeah. at least talk to them briefly about what they're doing and. The idea of having them off site somewhere, even though we have the Lafayette store and we're soon to have a, a North Shore store that will be separate, it's nice to see those e-com guys and, and have a relationship yeah, with them. Yeah, that's very cool. It must be exciting. Yeah, it is. It Same is. product go out the door. Right? Yeah. When you look back on, on the Lafayette store uh, and the energy that it took to get a you know a nice big operation up like that, how did that impact you and your staff that – Helped, helped you support that while still running, you know, a big operation in Baton Rouge? That's such a uh, good question because when we opened that store, I was, so I bought the business in summer of 20, 2006. We had already been negotiating pretty much close to signing a lease on the Lafayette space. And I bought the business and now I was going to expand to another location um, in a very short period of time, yeah, that's that's something. I got married in October of 2006 and bought a house in um, 
May of 2006 while I was still in school. My wife got pregnant in March of 07. <laughs> so on October 13th of 2007, we had our one year anniversary. She was non, or probably about, I guess she was uh, uh, seven months pregnant. We had opened this new store and we had just taken over an, an old business. And so it was, you know, it was, I'm not gonna, it was tough on everybody. I mean, you know, it was tough on um, my relationship with my family. It was tough on my relationship with um, the existing employees because I had just come in to, you know, take over this business and we were family business. I mean, the, the writing was on the wall. They all knew it was coming, but I was inexperienced and immature and, you know, still finding my way. And I think it was, it was definitely tough on everybody. I mean, but we figured it out and got through it. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, we had one manager of our Baton Rouge store who had been there for a long time. He left the week after I opened the Lafayette store and I had no manager in Baton Rouge. And, you know, I was just on the road seven days a week delivering product between stores. My wife was, you know, pregnant and we're in, uh, we're entering our first big holiday season with two stores and, my son was born on December 20th of 2007. So it was just, it was a, it was a <laughs> zoo. It, sounds, it was controlled chaos. Yeah, that sounds wild. Yeah, didn't know what I was doing. Like I told you earlier in, in the show that one thing my dad instilled in me was just hard work and let's figure it out and persevere. And that's what we did. And we sorted it out and figured out how to run the, these businesses and how to meet the financial obligations we need to meet. So a big gap between store two, I'm, I'm calling, uh, maybe maybe I'm not using the right uh, numbers here, but I'm calling Jefferson number two, but whatever. You, and then River Ranch. And a big gap between River Ranch is what I'm trying to say and Mandeville, which you're opening soon. Yeah. So does it get each, as you're approaching this, I think your, your building's maybe under construction now? Currently, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And your open date is when? Uh, we'll open in late February, or early March of 23. Okay. So you're, you're kind of in the midst of it or at the, you know, so when you look at it, you're older, you're more experienced, your team's been together. Do you see or forecast this new opening to be smoother than your last one as far as the, your support goes? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things that I wanted to when I after I opened up the Lafayette store as a young adult and went through and we've been through um, manager changes in both stores and and ups and downs with the increased competition with e-commerce and direct to consumer and those kind of things that we wanted to figure out. But one of the things that I just I can't emphasize this enough, but it just it makes a big difference is just uh, the people that you work with. You know, none of this is possible without having a, a team that you can trust and that you yeah. really enjoy working with. That's one thing that all this is at the credit of the team that works underneath us. I mean, we just yeah. we all love working together. We love what the backpacker is. We love the brand. We love the stuff we sell. And um, and I'm just I'm fortunate enough to have a team that believes in what we're doing. And so. I do believe that this one will be a lot different than it was when we opened that Lafayette yeah. store. You know, we, I mean, when we were opening Lafayette, it was my pregnant wife and I and the dog sitting on the uh, second floor, putting price tags on 300 boxes of merchandise in September watching, uh, it was a year, I'll never forget it. It was the fall that LSU had Matt Flynn and we won the national championship and, yeah. and we'd sit on the, uh, we'd bring the TV with rabbit ears, plug it into the wall watch LSU football all day and tag merchandise and get in the car and drive back to Baton Rouge. And uh, it, I see this going very differently from that as far <laughs> as just our team is great and they, and their experience. And I think it's going to be a, a really fun transition and they are, they've earned it. Yeah, You know, when you walk in your stores, you can feel that in your employees. I mean, they're outdoor minded people. They're generally healthy and, and active and, you know, I, I think that's a great starting point for building a great employee. Hennis T. Bourgeois provides accounting services, litigation support, as well as tax and assurance services to companies and individuals throughout the region. With offices in Baton Rouge, Denham Springs, New Orleans, and Hammond, their team of professionals have a wide range of specialized expertise and give personalized attention to each client they work with. 
HTB serves all types of business structures, including corporations, private businesses, startups, individuals, and more. So call them today to learn how they can help you. Reach out to them by phone or learn more at their website, www.htbcpa.com. A little testimonial here. HTB has been my accounting firm for over 30 years and have guided my initial company from startup to expanding to numerous operating companies. HTB has provided guidance in helping us expand across the U.S., doing business in more than 30 states. Flat out, HTB has made all the difference in the world to our business. This podcast is sponsored by NAI Ladder & Bloom, Louisiana's leading commercial real estate firm, offering expertise in every discipline, including office, industrial, retail, multifamily, and corporate services. Their agents guide you through the real estate process from start to finish using a host of marketing, prospecting, and analytical technologies. As leading entrepreneurs, your valuable time and resources should align with the most trusted name in commercial real estate, NAI Ladder & Bloom. Learn how they can work for you at www.ladderbloom.com. I think we're getting ready to talk about Mandeville opening up. You mentioned that. Mm-hmm. This store is yet a little bit smaller, right? Around 7,500 feet. I was curious, is that the path moving forward? Do you see yourself as you expand doing smaller footprint stores? We do. If you can call 7,500 small. Yeah, and I feel like 7,500 square feet is still a generous size store yeah, for, for sure. what we do. For sure. We feel like um, in our experience is that both of our stores have two floors. It adds to a customer barrier as well as it adds to a staffing barrier. You know, the customer experience and the interaction with our team is really important to me and our culture. And we don't want to be pushy salespeople, but we want to be available. And in a world where employee pay is becoming more competitive and we want to have more long lasting jobs for everybody, every level of the company, including our salespeople, we feel like staffing a smaller store would provide that better, a better life for our staff and for, and a better experience for our customers as well. And so it's, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but our inventory management fulfillment team has uh, really changed a lot over the years and our decisions on how we manage that has uh, helped and we're able to carry less inventory, but cycle it through faster and pay better attention to what our customers are asking for. And, uh, our, our smaller staff that's more full time helps us do that as well, and it's, so that's interesting. So on the buying side, by making that a little more robust by adding staff there, manage your inventory better, have more real time deliveries, and and therefore bring the square footage of your store down. Right, is what you're saying. Correct. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it's great. I'm, and we have to treat, <clears throat> we have a hybrid approach of outdoor gear and creating something that customers really enjoy, that they like, is comfortable. It's something that they want to come in multiple times for. So I don't want to call it, it's definitely not fashion, but it is more of a forward thinking tune to the outdoors. And for some of us, it's fashion. Yeah, okay. exactly. But uh, the days of just having brown pants on the wall for that you can, that are quick dry is kind of, a thing of the past. We want to make sure that we're offering new colors and that kind of thing. So we need to treat our inventory as a, um, as a perishable. I mean, definitely not to the tune as a grocery store would, but we want to make sure that our customers are seeing fresh new product and having, you know, cycling through it quicker definitely helps present that to our customers. Yeah. Very cool. Again, you're getting ready to open Mandeville in, in the near future. Are you in a place in your business where you're already starting to think about markets beyond? Everything, nothing's off the table. Um, we know that Mandeville is our number one priority right now, and the excitement and energy around the e-commerce side of the business is also a priority. And not to mention we have the travel company, which has also been growing a, at a very good rate as well. And so we've got these things that are we're very involved with right now that we're giving – investment time and energy into so we know that that's our our core focus and that but you know nothing's off the table we we know that my goal as an entrepreneur is to provide long-term meaningful jobs to people who love the outdoors and we know that 
expanding helps do that and we can provide more of those jobs and we can provide better jobs to the people that are already in our business. If expanding is what we need to do to make sure that we continue to provide those meaningful, long lasting jobs to our employees, then that's what we're going to do. There's some products that you sell, I'm thinking the fish and kayaks, that when they first came into the market are kind of new to the market, right? So a lot of people that fish Louisiana marshes, you know, may have bateaus or bass boats or, you know, center consoles, uh, marsh boat kind of things. But the, the, the fishing kayak has really opened it up for people that, you know, don't have that budget to buy the boat. Right. And you, you've been really instrumental in building that movement. Tell us what's going on with that. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Kayak fishing really changed the ability for someone who doesn't want to spend or can't spend thirty, forty thousand dollars on a bay boat or even ten, yeah. you know, on a center on a small center console. Or maybe they don't want the headache. They don't want to have broken down motors and insurance and a trailer and all these things that you have to deal with. Kayak fishing really kind of filled the, a much needed gap in Louisiana. Even when you look down in Texas and certain areas of Florida, you can wade fish because it's hard bottom. You can't do that in South Louisiana. It's mushy and it's soft. And kayaks change that. You can get in, you know, four inches of water and see redfish swimming through the mud, something that people never even could see yeah. before they had a kayak. So it's really opened it up and opened it up to a, a new market of people who, like I said, they don't have the budget to buy. And these kayaks have the, the pedals, right? So you're, you're pedaling with your feet and it's got the fins underneath that are propelling it. Uh-huh. Um, and so you, your hands are free. You, you know, get a little steering mechanism, but your hands are free to actually fish. Right? Yeah. I mean, the market's really evolved. I mean, I'll, I'll remember the first time that we got into kayak fishing and we, we decided to, we'd had some kayak fishermen in and out of the stores looking at our existing product, which were really sea kayaks that had been modified to become, to be used for fishing. Right. And there was a, a, a group that was just getting started and they're still around today called Bayou Coast Kayak Fishing Club. And we went down to the first kayak fishing tournament that they hosted in 2006 in Fushan. It was right after Katrina and Rita hit. And we, Served them jambalaya, and it was like 50 or 60 guys. No kid. And fast forward, you know, to 2013, 14, they're bringing 300 guys to the same tournament, and the and the club has over 400 members. And the, the kayaks that evolved from this sea kayak that was designed to fish out of to these high-tech pedal drives, super stable, huge, comfortable seats for sitting in the um, – so, for sitting in a kayak all day where – Older guys with bad backs and bigger guys could get into them. And it's really changed the perception of being in a kayak all day. I mean, it's bimini tops on some of these things, you know, yeah. everything you can think of. Yeah. And so the, the, the publicity in Louisiana is really kind of the kayak headquarters of the world at this point. Really? Kayak fishing headquarters. I mean, Grand Isle, you know, you had think guys like Danny Ray who got behind the movement, who was a fishing guide down there who got magazines down to Grand Isle, and he had uh, articles of people fishing down in the Grand Isle. He was a guide. He started Ride the Bull, which is now the world's largest kayak fishing tournament, uh, which is coming up at the end of August. And we sponsored that. We worked with Bayou Coast Kayak Fishing Club, and we got behind every area of the kayak fishing world we could get behind. We we just believed in it, and we thought it was fun. Yeah, And it still is fun. It's just such a the community is fantastic. They love being together. It's such a social sport. Even though when you're out fishing, you're by yourself in this yeah. kayak, everybody gets off the water and they party together. Yeah. And they yeah. enjoy talk, telling stories and sharing pictures and all this stuff. And you, next thing you know, you've been fishing by yourself all day and you get off the water and you're surrounded by 700 people at a kayak fishing tournament. But all telling the same stories and all yeah. have these great... It's just... Uh, it's everybody who I've mentioned who've gotten behind this movement, including the manufacturers has been, just been a part of building this whole thing in South Louisiana. Well, you know, it's, it's unique. If you compare it to the traditional fishing, uh, in a boat, right. Mm -hmm. And you're by yourself, but it's also simple. I think there's a lot of attraction to the simplicity. I mean, you can literally throw it in the back of your bed of your truck and go. Yeah. You know? And, and, uh, I know that's appealing to me for sure. Yeah, it is. It's, it's kind of funny you say that because when we started this, it was everybody in, who was into the outdoors had Jeep Cherokees and Tahoes and things like that. And the four-door truck, as people started buying four-door pickup trucks, that actually catapulted the kayak fishing world even more because you just you, yeah. everybody was concerned about having this big, heavy kayak to throw on your roof. 
Now you got this big pickup truck. You just slot it into the bed yeah. and don't yeah. even have to lift it up. It's yeah. it's just so interesting how all these things have contributed to the sport. I want to talk about marketing and how you guys market and what is the significance of social media in your marketing? It has taken a, since about 2015, it's become our primary source of marketing, both organic and paid advertising. Yeah. Facebook offers such great tools like advertising. They, they offer events. So if you're having an in-store event, you can post an event, sponsor it, let people see it. You can target markets. You, you know, you can target geographical areas. You can target certain people. So Facebook's been great for that. And then you've got Instagram, which has your followers, but it's also a catalog of what, you know, people look for now, you know, a lot of people, when they see their favorite restaurant, oh, do they have any specials? Are they open on Sundays? A lot of people are using Instagram almost like a phone book. You look up the business you're looking for and see what they're looking at. And so we want to make sure that we keep our business relevant on these different platforms, make sure that customers know what's going on. And so how robust is your social media? I mean, do you have a team in-house? We have a marketing director in-house, make sure that all of our channels, whether it's email blasts or in-store signage or social media, all has a very similar message. And then we have a separate social media manager who's on retainer who helps with the actual photography and videography. And he's a, he's an, he's a great guy to work with, and he comes in and helps us with whatever we need help with to make things, to polish things up. A couple of things I wanted to mention, some recognition. You know, the Baton Rouge Business Report does such a great job, recognized you as a member of the 40 Under 40 a few years ago, which is always a great thing. But more recently, the best place to work. I was wondering if you could tell us what that means to you as the owner. Obviously, it's an honor to be recognized by Baton Rouge Business Report for those kinds of things. Uh, and when you think about the people that are involved with that, that are honored, whether it's 40 under 40 or best places to work, it's a, it's a great honor to be that, not just for me, but for our team as well, you know, and I, I feel like the 40 under 40 award is a, is, isn't just an, a, it isn't just about me. It's a award that goes to our whole staff. Uh, yeah. Even though I'm the leader, it's, it's something that um, they recognize us as being a, worthy uh, recipient of that so it was it, it's been it was a great feeling it was a great thing to be recognized yeah it's nice I, I think the significance of the best places to work is that your employees saying hey this is a great place to work which is very meaningful and I'm convinced that the significance of that recognition is it tells potential hires hey it's, it's a good place to consider you know if you're looking around and so I think there's real value to that recognition. Yeah. Look, wrapping up here, a couple of wrap-up things. I was curious what your favorite trips to make are nowadays. Oh, that's a uh, loaded question. I love doing. I love doing so much. I mean, I, I'm anybody who knows me knows that I'm a uh, adventure guy, and they know that my favorite two things to do are you know are fishing and skiing. I, I do a, an annual heli skiing trip with some guys that I've got connected with really? that guys from all over the country. That's a, a, a blast that I do. And you guys are heli to the top of a mountain. Yeah. It's up in Canada. No kidding. Yeah. So that that's, and it's right in my wheelhouse, you know, as we do ski trips and that kind of stuff. But yeah. also I, I just, I grew up skiing with my dad, like I said earlier, and I take my family skiing. It's just something that I, it just, it, yeah. it's, I love to do it. I mean, that's extreme-ish, right? I'd say so. Yeah, it's kind of extreme. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I love to do that. I have a, uh, we, we have a place in Pasco Shan and we keep a, and I, we have a boat there that we use and we fish a lot and we um, do those kind of things. But, you know, I'm, I'm an adventure guy. I love doing, I love going outdoors. So if it's, um, whether it's a hunting trip or whether it's a camping trip in 2018, I took my family to the mountains to go camping for a week. Man, those things, they just, they get me super excited about traveling uh, my wife and I went to Europe for the first time and went skiing back in, in Switzerland in March this year that was just outstanding so we definitely you know yeah. ask me to plan a trip to New York City I'm not your guy <laughs> ask me to tra plan a trip to Lake Tahoe or to Colorado or something like that I'm, I'm, I'm your, or even to Grand Isle yeah. I'm your guy that's awesome we talked about markets and that you know, maybe I and I didn't ask you specifically last question here what is your vision? Uh, for the future, as you look out five or 10 years, what do you see? 
I see us pursuing the dream of creating this business into something that our employees can spend the rest of their lives working on. If they love our business like they say they do and they enjoy being a part of it, then I think that we, uh, my vision is to create them every opportunity that they want to take on challenges. So I've got a great leadership team. They share the vision for growth and excitement, and I'm going to lead them that way if that's the way that we see that we can do things. Yeah. So whether it's more stores or whether it's the travel business or whether it's the e-commerce side of things, we know that we see an opportunity to provide main street, you know, big difference between us and REI is that, you know, you look at an REI, they go into large strip centers. They might be, you know, in certain markets, they might be next to an old Navy or something like that. We see ourselves as appealing to more of a main street environment. You know, we want to be in the older parts of town. We want to be in, we want to be next to a coffee shop that people know and recognize. We want to be next to the the local restaurant that people have been, uh, that people love about their town. Yeah. That's how we see ourselves. And our goal is that, you know, and our vision for the business is that no matter what the competition is, no matter whether it's direct to consumer or online retailers, people are always going to buy outdoor gear. People love the outdoors and that's never changed. And as long as they're out there buying it, we want to make sure that we're there provided. So, And I think they like to go, I know I do, I like to go and see it and touch it and something about, you know, if you're buying a sleeping bag or a tent or hiking shoes, I mean, you want to test them out. And I, I, I agree. I don't see that changing. Yeah. Michael, it has been a treat to talk to you. I'm just extremely excited about your business. And <laughs> thank uh, you. <laughs> y'all are doing such a good job, have built such a formidable brand. You know, super proud of what you what you've accomplished and continued success in all you do, my friend. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. So Michael Matthews is a young man. He's already been in business for 17 years. He's not 40 yet. It's amazing what he's doing. You know, he can acknowledge that, yeah, when he first got in business, he was young, he was immature, he hadn't figured things out, but he grew into the position. And now he's a very seasoned entrepreneur and business owner. I love how Michael talks about he will take the business where his employees want it to go and how they want to grow, which is very interesting. I also love how uh, his involvement with the kayak fishing community getting involved and helping build that community, which is good for his customers, it's good for Louisiana, and having uh, more people have access to our great state resources. Uh, it's very similar to what our previous guest, uh, Olivia Stewart, was doing and wanting to help create the Rum Trail. So I love those similarities. Uh, Michael is doing a great job. We wish him continued success. We appreciate you guys watching. And we'll catch you next time. We would like to thank our title sponsor, B1 Bank. They can be found online at b1bank.com. The Next Entrepreneur is produced by Propel Productions. You can find more information at propelyourstory.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the Next Entrepreneur podcast and hit the bell for notifications. You can also follow us on social media. The links are in the description below.